How do you manage um, the instant feedback that you can get from your users or you know, with the changes that you're making? Um, and also, just we know more than ever before about the people that we're serving and that we're designing for. How do we balance that from our own intuition about what's correct and right to do? I'll, be, I'll share one simple thing, which is I always think that the consumer can tell you those things that they hate, <laughs> but maybe not so much what they're going to love. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I like listening to them for, oh, that's a disaster. No, we shouldn't do that. But I rarely encourage teams to sit behind the glass or sit in their home or we're deep, deep into consumer behavior and really watching them but uh, and kind of understanding how our products fit in their lives. But at the end of the day, they're great at telling you that like, this thing really sucks in this <laughs> environment or whatever. Maybe not so great at kind of Same, understanding what product. could be, mm -hmm. right? So, I think, you know, people's relationship in particular to global digital platforms is, is really interesting and different. They are um, active participants in making the experience. And so, you know, that response that people have is is real and it's valid and it must be uh, respected, right? And some of it is change aversion, which is real across all the design disciplines. <laughs> and with digital, it's particularly pronounced because people build a lot of muscle memory right. around how they use things. And even if you give them a significantly better design, it's enormously frustrating to use the new thing for a period of time. Yep. And so, you know, the hate rolls in. <laughs> and, you know, if you've done your job well and you've tested and you've validated and you've tried to be, you know, kind of dispassionate about the emotional response, you can usually weather through it. But you also have to be open to, you know, sifting through that feedback and separating the things that are about that change aversion and then things that may just be, you know, technical bugs or right, like things right. that you might not have gotten right. And and so that I think is one of the trickiest pieces because, you know, as a as a as an industry we try to be very human centered. And so it's very difficult to say, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop empathizing for a while <laughs> because I'm hearing all of this pain and suffering and to hear that and just say, all right, wait wait a few weeks. Something weeks, months to see that kind of change aversion wear off. And so it's it's pretty interesting from a, you know, kind of a systems perspective or a psychology perspective to kind of understand how people are interacting with, with change in experience. I believe that one of the things that has been most helpful for us is acknowledging that it's nuanced. Yeah. That they're just some of the choices, um, one, some of the choices we make might be wrong, mm -hmm. period. <laughs> um, some may be right by whatever the measure is, but need to be experienced, to be understood over a long period of time. Um, and some may have uh, other purposes to the benefit of the, of the people using the product or a member of the community that uh, they may not fully understand at the surface level, um, but whose benefit sort of reve reveals itself. And one thing that it's put into sharp focus for us is the relationship between the design of the product itself and the communication design around that. And that these things are very, very uh, connected. I think we, we could view those as two separate tools or skill sets we have and sort of deploy them independently. And sometimes you do. But very, very often the relationship between how we choose to talk about the thing, when we choose to talk about it, how we design that experience of the narrative around it really affects the perception of the thing itself. Mm -hmm. um, are they excited to use it the first time they try it? Has some implications on whether that first use experience is a positive one or not. Mm -hmm. And we can use communication design to you know, hopefully set them up to be excited about that experience. Mm -hmm. How how much in your industry is the difference between like you mentioned earlier, like the gut, like the gut instinct versus say kind of the more the analytics or the, the the feedback? Which what is the balance? It's an interesting point. You said the feedback, because for example, we um, never ask the consumer what they want, because if we want to ask feedback, we wouldn't surprise them. So it's very different from a normal setup where you're going to ask a pool of people, what car should we develop? We never do that because if we were to, we wouldn't surprise them. Then, of course, there's a practice of the borderline, we call it. It's like 
till where can you push creativity and it will be bought. Once you pass it, it's a disaster, you don't sell it. So in the companies I've worked for, it was a practice used always that we had to make at least a disaster a year. <laughs> because otherwise we wouldn't know how good we are pushing that borderline. Interesting. And is that disaster then circle back and then like two years later? Yeah, like exactly. So sometimes disaster didn't sell and then we had the best example in Alessia. It was like something came back after 20 years and it became a bestseller. Mm -hmm. So it was way ahead of his time. Hmm. Maybe way. It was a programma eight. It was a whole set of uh, serving. So it was a tray in stainless steel, then it was porcelain parts, wood parts, it was beautiful. And then suddenly, after like 15 years, key students started asking for it. Hmm. And the uh, owner of the company said, hmm, that's interesting. And he kept more requests, and he said, maybe we should launch it again. <laughs> and so they launched it, and it was a huge success. Wow. So you, it's very interesting to hear the feedback, which of course we apply to in our business, as selling. But from the conception of the product, it's very different. At the end of the day, I think what our com my company stands for is, um, Max Mara stands for, is uh, cultivating the new generation of shoppers, mm -hmm. but really maintaining that core that is about this intrinsic value in the, in the collections since how they are designed. And it's something wonderful to count on with all the uh, the different collections and different uh, designs we are bombarded with continuously to be able to enter a place and uh, breeze and say, oh my God, I can find something that I can really, yeah. don't have to spend so much time thinking and I'm gonna feel really comfortable when I leave this place and not have to have to alter the hem of the coat or it's the feet of a coat or the tie of a coat because every, it, yeah. it, I feel wonderful in it. You're ready to face a world. So I think I, you know. I think fashion is a <clears throat> fashion is an interesting place to, to to query this, but it exists in any mm -hmm. industry where design is central to the, the ethic of the brand and the and and where the brand relies on good design. Fashion is just a great laboratory for it because um, the best fashion houses have a very clear sense of who they are, but and and they apply logic and their uh, there's there's a lot of fiscal responsibility that allows them to continue, but they have to use a lot of gut. But ultimately you understand that you're negotiating need and you're negotiating desire. And so our equation for that is different because we have the vector of the body that moves into that, into that scenario where we are interacting with your body and we have to understand your psychology around an aesthetic, but also your sense of self. Mm -hmm. And when you encounter our product, how it's going to make you feel. When, when we communicate the, the notion of our brand and the entry into our brand, how do we circumscribe that experience so that you even begin to start feeling the power of a garment on your body that will motivate you to come and try it on?